Hi and welcome back everybody to another reaction video where we try to learn something new and to spread history on YouTube. Okay, so today we have the video called The War That Changed the English Language from Oversimplified. Uh, I already covered a few videos from Oversimplified uh, and this video was recommended a few times on our Discord server and, all, and also in the comment sections on YouTube um, under different videos. So I decided to take it uh, up today because I don't know, the sun is shining and I kind of feel I'm kind of in the oversimplified mood. Um, so yeah, if you have any additional information, interesting information or corrections, whatever interesting stuff that you know about the topic, you can share it with us in the Discord uh, or in the comment section below. I'm sure our community is going to appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we're just going to jump in into the video. If you want to be part of our history community, uh, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Uh, if you want to get notified when new videos come out, you can also join our Discord server. Uh, the link is going to be in the description below. And yeah, as always, there are going to be polls in the upper corners of the video. So you can... Uh, I don't know, there's going to be some questions that I have after the video and then you can share your opinions, not only in the polls, but also in the comment section. And then you can also see what other be people, like percentage wise, uh, clicked on the polls. So yeah, let's just jump into the video. And as always, the original video is going to be in, be in the description below. Uh, go give them a view and a like because oversimplified and I think every creator on YouTube deserves it. So, okay, let's jump in to the video. This video was made possible by Skillshare, an online learning community with over 17... Oh no, I didn't make... I didn't bring coffee with me. ...thousand no! classes in just about anything <laughs> you can imagine. Keep watching until the end of the video to learn how you can get your first two months for free. England in the Middle Ages. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. The children are playing in the village square. What a wonderful time to be alive. Hey, you're dying of dysentery. And also we're being raided by Vikings. <laughs> what an awful time to be alive. Okay, so the Vikings. It's the year 900. Europe is a Vikings wet dream. Raids galore. Hey, you want to go raid Paris? Okay. That particular raid didn't go too well, but the king of the Franks said, you guys are pretty tough and scary. How about we give you land in northern France, and in return, you protect yeah, us Normandy. from other Vikings. And it was agreed. The Vikings set up the Duchy of Normandy, and then they went full on French, converting to Christianity, learning the language, and making babies with the locals. England also had its fair share of Viking problems. In the 800s, Danish Vikings had conquered most of the country, uh, but the Anglo-Saxons eventually managed to kick them out, although they left... Uh, just a quick note. I, I, I'm not sure if they're going to mention it, but there was uh, written the Dane law. Uh, because of the Danes and uh, in England there was a uh, Essex law and a whoa, what's the second one and something like that you know like for, for people there uh, the law that needs needed to be uh, you know like followed but as the Vikings invaded uh, the this part of today's England like like the the eastern coast was settled mostly by Viking or Danes and then they instituted the Dane law like in the around like the beginning of the 10th century which was actually above the Essex and whatever other law there there was left behind a bunch of Viking settlers now this guy's king he sucks replace him with his brother and he was like hey baby how you doing and, and had a son a and then thing. turned around and was like hey baby how you doing and had another son and then he died <laughs> and no one was sure which son to make just king hey, this baby. one because he's older <laughs> not if I have anything to do with it that works for us too uh, then he grew up and married the Duke of Normandy's daughter and had a bunch of kids remember this one he's important then his advisors came to him and said hey man all those Viking settlers that are living here they might band together and kill you well then why don't we kill them first and so it was. Logic. This pissed off the Danish king, who launched an invasion, and the Vikings conquered England once again. Then the Anglo-Saxons unconquered it, then the Vikings reconquered it. The king's family had to go into exile, including Edward. Remember him? He went to Normandy where he lived for 30 years. He and his brother Alfred tried to return to England to retake the throne from the Vikings, but they were betrayed by the Earl of Wessex, who said, Hey friend, I'll take you to London where all the nobles are waiting to make you king. Oh no, look out, red hot poker in the eyes. I can't see! 
and thus you can't be king. Edward then escaped back to Normandy. After a few more Viking kings came and went, one finally died without it. I'm sure that, that this time period, like the, Nor uh, the Norman invasion, the Viking invasion, uh, and, and, and like uh, fighting and so on, I, I think that it's pretty much covered in like the British history textbooks or whatever. If you're from Great Britain, and I know that there are some of you, because Great Britain is actually the second largest like audience uh, on this channel under the U uh, and the first ones are from the US. So please, please tell me what you exactly kind of learned about that period. I'm really interested. In air, and Edward was called back to England where he became king. And that's where our story begins. Okay, so then, ah, the Battle of Hastings. Here's the thing about becoming a king in the Middle Ages. Often your entire country won't support you at first. You can be vulnerable to rebellions, and it's up to you to take control. Fortunately for Edward, there was already a super powerful guy who had a lot of control over England. And if Edward could get his support, then England would be his. Who is this guy? Oh, piss, it's the guy who gave my brother the red hot poker in the eyes. <laughs> After an awkward moment where Edward exiled Godwin from the country, he eventually had to give in and let him keep his earldom, possibly after Godwin gave him a bunch of gold and said he was very, very sorry. King Edward also married Godwin's daughter. Then Godwin died and his massive fortune was passed down to his sons, who all became earls. In particular, this one became the new Earl of Wessex. Harold Godwinson was now King Edward's brother-in-law. He was a close advisor to the king, a brave warrior who had proven himself in battle against the Welsh, and in many ways he was almost like a co-king. Uh-oh, Edward got old and he's on his deathbed. Possibly for religious reasons, or maybe because he wasn't happy about having to marry her, he didn't boink his wife, and as a result has no kids, meaning there's no I'm obvious heir to the throne, meaning I'm gonna be king. He does have a grandnephew, it could be him. Hmm, now let's go with me. Just one problem. I mentioned that Edward's mother was a Norman. Edward grew up in Normandy, and he had a lot of Norman friends. The current Duke of Normandy was William the Bastard. Why was he called the Bastard? One day, his father was sneaking out of his castle when his advisors said, Where are you going? Uh, to the tanner's shop. Why? To get a... Tan. But that was a lie. <laughs> Firstly, because tanners give you leather, not tans. And secondly, because he was really going to see the tanner's daughter. One thing leads to another, and out comes baby William. Born out of wedlock. Thus, an absolute bastard. His father died when William was seven or eight, and he became the new Duke. He spent most of his childhood narrowly avoiding assassination, which probably turned him into the big balls tough guy he's remembered as today. In 1051, the town of Alessant tried to rebel against him, and the townspeople beat on dead animal skins as an insult to his commoner mother. William was furious, and he responded by, well, let's just say it wasn't pretty. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. William and Edward were good friends, and Edward allegedly promised that William could have the English throne after him. A decade later, how- Yeah, like, like that, that's common throughout history, like like um, from the uh, from the like you know like Western European countries to the Eastern European countries to the Ottoman Empire to the Chinese, whenever there's like a uh, a vacuum in the on the throne, people are going to fight and and kill each other just to get the throne and the power. So that's that's kind of a normal thing. Old Godwinson even visited William and pledged an oath time. to him over holy relics, promising that William could be the next king of England. Although it's possible Harold only did it because William was holding his family hostage. So when William heard that the king was on his deathbed, he said, Hooray, I'm gonna be king. So now you have two extremely powerful men who both think they're about to become the next king. But wait. This guy is the king of Norway. He spent most of his life as a warrior for hire, fighting for whoever would give him the most gold. You name a place, he probably fought a war there. Poland? Yep. Estonia? Yep. Against pirates in the Mediterranean? Yep. The Holy Lands? Sicily? And Bulgaria? Yep. He got crazy rich off the back of it and was swimming in gold. Then he returned home and became king. One of the previous Norwegian kings had made an agreement with one of England's Viking kings, saying that when that Viking king died, the king of Norway would get the English throne. Hardrada felt that because of this agreement, he was now entitled to the English throne. He was also eager to go on one last big conquest that would turn him into a legend. So when he got word that... Yeah, just a quick note on the Vikings. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, they weren't only attacking England, of course. They, they were, would uh, attack and raid and, and bring home slaves from the Baltic states. So Latvia, Lithuania, is, uh, Estonia, to, like today's territory. Russia, also the Novgorod region, um, um, and of, they were also in the Mediterranean. So, you know, like Norway is way, way up north, but they would go all the way to the Mediterranean. They were also in Constantinople. Uh, they were, I think, 
also guards to some of the of the uh, oh my god the rulers in Constantinople they were also in Sicily they were everywhere in France in England and so on so yeah. just wanted to point it out Edward was on his deathbed he thought I'm gonna invade England and then I'm gonna be king so now we have three extremely powerful men who all think they're about to become the next king of England and that means somebody's probably about to get hurt. Back in England, Harold Godwinson is watching over the dying king, Edward. Suddenly, he comes out with a shocking announcement. Hey, uh, everyone, gather in. That's it. Come closer. Don't be shy. Okay, so I've got bad news. The king is dead. Um, I know, very sad. Uh, but good news. He said that I should be the next king. So, hooray for me. And, um, oh yeah, he said that if he once told anyone else they could be king, that he doesn't like them anymore, and they should just stay in Normandy. And also he said that no one should ask any further questions. <laughs> okay, good talk. Go, um, go do whatever yeah, it is you do. Usually it took months of preparation to crown a new king, but Harold rushed it and he had himself crowned the same day King Edward was buried. In Normandy, William's advisors came to him and said, Hey Big Willie, bad news, Harold Godwinson has taken the English throne. And William was furious, so he sent an envoy to Harold who said, William says you stole the throne and demands you immediately return it to him. Hmm, let me think about that. Nah. <laughs> no. He said no. That bastard. Wait, I thought you were the bastard. Dude. I'm cool. I'm cool. <laughs> William immediately began gathering his armies together and preparing for an invasion of England. Now, killing a king was generally frowned upon in old-timey Europe because they were considered to have been chosen by God himself. So back in Normandy, William had to get God on his side. He needed the Pope's blessing for his conquest. So he went to the Pope and said, Godwinson made an oath to me over holy relics, and then he usurped the throne. Can I kill him? Eh, sure, why not? <laughs> so the Pope gave William his blessing, meaning William now had God on his side. Everything. Yeah, and it was always a mutual thing, like Popes and, and, and different leaders or... or, or known uh, figures throughout history uh, especially in the middle ages where uh, it was a symbiotic relationship we al already talked about it in a different uh, video but the pope got you know like probably gold or something like that in return and if you had the approval of the pope behind you then it's also a big motivator fact and, and a factor in battle for your soldiers, for your people, and uh, and a big stamp of legitimacy. So yeah. Everything was ready to go. Just one problem. The wind. It was blowing the wrong way. And William had to wait with his army in Normandy, while Godwinson waited with his army in the south of England. Really? They waited, and waited, and waited, and then William said screw it and sailed for England and got shipwrecked because the wind was blowing the wrong way. So then he decided to keep on waiting. They waited for two months and the wind never changed. Eventually Godwinson got bored La and also ran out of food for his soldiers. So he sent general. them all home and he returned to London. The south coast was undefended and all William could do was keep waiting. While the northerly wind kept William in Normandy, it was carrying Hardrada and his Viking army to England. Hardrada oh. landed near the old Viking city of York and defeated a regional army led by the northern earls and York surrendered. When Godwinson heard about this, he must have been pretty upset. He had just disbanded his army, and now he had to gather them all together again and march all the way north. He made the exhausting journey in just four days, which is crazy quick, and he caught the Vikings off guard and unprepared for battle. The two armies stood on either side of the River Derwent. Legend says that a berserker Viking single-handedly held the only bridge crossing the river, dodging arrows and fending off attackers, until some English soldiers got under the bridge in a barrel and gave him the old spear in the jewels. This gave the Vikings enough time to form a shield wall, but because they had been caught off guard, many weren't wearing their... Yeah, look up berserkers uh, in, in the Viking army. There's still a lot of things that need to be discovered about berserkers, but... Just check it out. I don't want to say something, I don't know, that's false or something like that about them, but check it, check them out. It's a really interesting thing. Their chainmail and armor, and the English eventually defeated them, killing Hardrada, and with him, bringing the Viking era in England to an end. Mm. Also, a question if somebody is watching from Scandinavia, especially uh, Norway, do you also uh, put a big emphasis uh, uh, on that period? and the battles, and, and uh, Hedrala, Hed... Bringing the Viking era in England to an end. I'm really interested in, if, if you also learn in school about that. And also, how Scandi Scandinavians, and what do you learn about the Vikings in school? 
Because, I mean, it's kind of, as far as I know, the Scandinavians weren't that much affected uh, with uh, all the, uh, you know, like, what is it called in English? Like the big, uh, uh, um, the big uh, movement of people, you know, like the Slavs when they came in, uh, the Hungarians, the Huns and so on, like all the big mixtures and so on. So I think as far as I know, the Scandinavians are like uh, a culture that kind of didn't get mixed too much with, with other, let's say, people. Na people. <laughs> Finally, William's fleet of over 700 ships and 14,000 men set sail and landed on the English coast at Pevensey and set up camp near Hastings. And Harold was still all the way in York. His exhausted army had to march all the way south just days after their battle with the Vikings. Harold made it to London and considered just staying there and waiting for William to come to him. But William forced Harold's hand by burning down a bunch of villages. Harold's army set out and met Williams on the 14th of October, 1066. And both sides prepared themselves for the Battle of Hastings. The English were on a hill, so they decided to stay there because it was a good defensive position. The Normans approached and the two sides probably spent a while yelling at each other. William and the Normans had a few tactical advantages over the English. The first were the archers. The Normans sent volley after volley of arrows at the English who formed a shield wall in defense. Then William sent his infantry up the hill. The English threw anything they had at them and the Normans couldn't break through the shield wall. Then the Normans next tactical advantage came into play. William sent his cavalry up the hill but even they struggled to break through the shield wall defenses. Wave after wave of infantry and cavalry came and Harold knew all he had to do was let the Normans exhaust themselves and he would win. But then something a bit strange happened. It's possible the Normans incorrectly believed William had been killed. Maybe they lost their will to fight against the shield wall or maybe it was an intentional deception tactic. But suddenly the Norman forces turned and ran away from the English. Believing they had won, the English broke their shield wall and chased down the retreating Normans who then turned around, encircled the English troops and cut them down. In the chaotic fighting that followed, Harold Godwinson was killed the most popular theory being that he took an arrow in the eye. The English were defeated and William had won. He was no more just a bastard. Now he was a conqueror. At first the English nobles were reluctant to make him king, but William- Just a quick note on the battle. Uh, you always, when you talk about battles throughout history, not only that time, but throughout history, you always need to try to put yourself in the position of a soldier on the field. You know, like, you have a hel helmet on. You can only see, I don't know, how, how much far away. You cannot see the... It's Everything is covered in blood, mud. If it's raining, it's even worse. If it's foggy, it's even worse, and so on. So it was actually pretty common that you uh, didn't saw things uh, in the midst of a battle, or that you thought that you... You, li you know, like, misinformation could spread uh, very easily. But maybe... It was also tactics. Maybe William just wanted them to, you know, like break the ranks, attack, and then he could en encircle them. Maybe, I don't know. What's your opinion on that? burned down a few more villages and the nobles eventually gave in and offered him the crown. As he was coronated, the local villagers in Westminster let out a cheer of support, but William thought it was a riot, so he burned down the village. <laughs> William then had to go on a long and costly campaign of quelling rebellions and burning down villages all over England to force the people into submission. And England went through a massive transformation under its new Norman rule. English nobles were replaced with Normans. They built castles and grand cathedrals, but one of the most interesting changes occurred within the English language. The Normans brought their dialect of French to England and it merged with Old English in ways we still live with today. First of all, the Normans were obviously the ones in power, so words related to power like government, judge, castle, and crown come from the Normans. Words that are considered posher or more refined are usually the Norman ones. At first the Anglo-Saxons- Now, now all, all the English-speaking, native English-speaking people are going to be, huh? probably weren't that friendly to the Normans, while the Normans likely weren't that amiable towards the Anglo-Saxons. An Anglo-Saxon might come into a room, but a Norman would enter into a chamber. An Anglo-Saxon might buy themselves a shirt, while a Norman would purchase a blouse. And while that filthy peasant's new shirt may be fair, the Norman blouse is absolutely beautiful. The Normans actually really? considered some Anglo-Saxon words so crude that I can't even say them on YouTube. But there's more. Ask an Anglo-Saxon what job he does, and he might respond with some low-level trade, such as a baker, a miller, or a shoemaker. But a Norman has a skilled trade, like a painter, a tailor, or a merchant. The Anglo-Saxon farmers working in the fields owned many cows, pigs, and sheep. But once they were served up in a Norman banquet, they became beef, 
pork, and mutton. And written English changed too. Really? Since many Anglo-Saxons couldn't write, the written language was romanticized. Your annoying friend that says cool whip might just be speaking an old English dialect, as the Anglo-Saxons originally wrote it when, where, and what, but the Normans swapped the W and H around, and the long English A vowel sounded more like an O to the Normans, so you can thank them that you live in a home, not a ham. Hey, fun fact about William, the man couldn't read or write, not in French, not in English, not in anything. Well, what if I told you there was a place where, where you could learn up? French, English, even For Japanese if you wanted? And not just that, not pick up that a musical instrument, or, learn to code games and apps, animation, Kingsport photography and film, anything Freedom. you could dream of. All taught by genuine experts, and you can get your first two months for free, I'm talking about Skillshare. With over 17,000 classes in the arts, business, technology, and more. I get a lot of comments asking how I'm I create these let, videos. Let the let the video that the sponsor go but i want to talk a little bit because this is focused all on the language like how how the english language changed with the norman conquest of 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 england and language is pretty interesting uh, when you look throughout history of a nation there's always a big influence on uh, on the on the on the language of that nation uh, so some of you know some of you who are maybe new to the channel or first time watching a video i'm actually from croatia so and that's a you know it's a it's a small country in some say central europe some say balkan some say uh southeastern europe whatever you, you want to call it that uh that country or that nation was a big uh, for a long time, a throughout the history, uh, a part of the Habsburg monarchy. Later on, Austria-Hungary. It was the border, con uh, like the borderlands with with the Ottoman Empire, um, and so on. And because of the big diversity in in the Habsburg monarchy, where you had Czechs, Slovak, Slovaks, Austrians, Hungarians, and so on, uh, throughout the history. The, the two big players inside of the monarchy, is, is, I mean, Austri Austrians and Hungarians, they wanted to conquer the other smaller nations, let's call them that way, through imposing their own language on them. So there are two terms that we use in Croatian, which is called Germanizatia and uh, Majorizatia, like Hungarization and Germanization of that territory, and because of that, uh, a, you know, like schools were opened that were only uh, allowed uh, the students to speak in German or in Hungarian, and so on and so on, and that st still today had a big influence on the language. There are a lot of things that we kind of take for granted which comes actually from uh, Austrian German or Hungarian but we also had influence on them like uh, on uh, Hungary zum uh, zum <laughs> uh, for an example let's say I think that it's actually an Hungarian origin word Kirai Kirai uh, which means King Kirai King and Croatians took that word, of course, they Slavenized it a little bit, and they say kral for king. Kral, kiraj. Uh, and about, like, a lot of different, you know, like, uh, um, examples. And there is also uh, a big Ottoman influence. So, uh, let's say, I don't know, the Germans and Austrians say for a... Oh my god, what's the English word for, for that? A mosque, let, let's say, e Englishmen uh, say, like people with uh, native English language, they say mosque for a, you know, like a Muslim church. Uh, and Germans and Austrians say uh, Moshe, but in Croatia we say Jamia, which is actually an Ottoman word. And you know, like a big, and of course, a uh, big influence in the culture with, with, 
with coffee and everything but as i said there are many examples and it's actually a pretty interesting thing um, to talk about like how the english involved with not only conquest conquests were a big part of it but also uh, through being a neighboring state to another state or maybe being in a union with that with that state so it's actually a pretty pretty interesting thing uh, if you if you have anything interesting let's say from from your country uh, where you know like you took words from other nations or other languages uh, I would I would be really interested to, to hear about that okay I hope that you enjoyed it uh, don't forget to take part in the polls um, question about the, que the questions I'm gonna think about a little bit later and I'm gonna add them I would really appreciate your comments as I said if you have corrections additional information and so on and uh, I just now noticed that I have kind of the Irish harf <laughs> kind of fitting but yeah we were talking about England not Ireland okay once again I hope that you enjoyed it if you want to be part of our history community we're now at approximately two and a half thousand rapidly growing it's growing so so fast I don't know uh, what I'm doing here uh, just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell that you don't miss out new videos and yeah until next time, see ya.